Uh, good morning to all of you. Welcome to our small group, formerly known as Bible Study. Um, I'm happy to have all of you um, here in our small group this morning, and I'm happy to have those of you who are joining with us online as well. It's good to know that we reach out beyond these walls with uh, what we, we talk about in here on Sunday mornings. My name is Shirley Haugen, and today we are in Acts chapter 12. We're halfway through, or we will be halfway through our study in Acts, and we'll be starting the second half of the, chap of the book of Acts next week. Today we're going to be talking about Peter's miraculous escape from prison. You know, last week's story was also about Peter. If you remember last week, um, Peter had traveled to Caesarea, or Caesarea, I always figured how to put the accents on that one. Caesarea to bring the good news of Jesus to Cornelius the centurion and in that story God was showing Peter that the good news of Jesus wasn't just for the Jews it was also for all the Gentiles as well and so in that story last week Cornelius a Gentile had this vision that Peter was going to come to him and bring him a message through which you and all your household will be saved and so he had this dream that this man, Peter, was going to come to him. And so he sent for Peter and Joppa, and Peter obliged. He came, and he did. He witnessed to Cornelius and all the people there. Before Peter had come, though, about the time the men were on their way to get Peter, he had this vision himself. He went into a trance. He had this vision about a, a sheet that came down out of heaven. And on the sheet were all these unclean animals, reptiles, and birds on it. And so Peter at first didn't know what that vision meant, but then somewhere along the way he realized that God was telling him that he shouldn't call anything unclean that God had declared clean. And so that was kind of God's way of saying, hey, these Gentiles that you think aren't good enough, they are. They're my people too. And so the gospel is open to everyone. Um, and this week we're going to be talking about Peter again. He's the um, main character in our story again today. And this is a really good story. It's a famous Bible story where God miraculously releases Peter from prison. I started to have a contest in here today to see who could sing the most songs, Christian songs, with lyrics about God breaking chains. Because it seems like there's a lot, there's a lot of music out there, good music. That, that where we sing about God releasing people from their chains or their shackles. And so there's a lot of good music about, really about this Bible story. Um, so at the beginning of today's story though, before we get into the miraculous rescue from prison, something really terrible happens right at the beginning of chapter 12. Starting in verse one, it says, it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. So King Herod in this story, you know, there were, there were many King Herods. <laughs> this King Herod is Herod Agrippa, King Herod Agrippa. And Herod Agrippa is the grandson of Herod the Great. And Herod the Great was the King Herod who ruled during the time of Jesus' birth. And so if you remember at that time, Herod the Great had heard about this baby boy who had been born king of the Jews, and he didn't like that. So he was determined to kill that baby boy, but since he couldn't find that particular baby boy, he just sent out an order that all the boys around Bethlehem who were two years old and under had to be killed. And so that's what Herod the Great did. And so this king in our story today, King Herod Agrippa, is the grandson of Herod the Great. And he's also the nephew of another Herod, Herod Antipas, who had a role in the trial of Jesus. In Luke 23, 11, it says, Then Herod, and this was Herod Antipas, Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him, dressing him in an elegant robe. They sent him back to Pilate. So this Herod, King Herod Agrippa, in our story today, he comes from a notorious family line, and he carries on the evil traditions of his forefathers. So one of the, the translations said that King Herod stretched out his hand to harass some of the church, some from the church. And so King Herod, as he goes out to persecute Christians, he's a little bit different than Saul, who was persecuted, you know, had been, before his conversion, Paul had... Saul, before he was Paul, Saul had been persecuting Christians. 
But at least Saul, when he was doing those terrible things, he was doing it out of religious conviction. He thought he was doing right by God when he persecuted Christians. But King Herod Agrippa, he persecuted Christians solely for political gain. Um, he was just trying to get the approval of the Jews and others who disliked the early Christians. So this wicked King Agrippa had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword, which probably means that he had James beheaded. And so this would have been devastating to the early church. Those who knew James were heartbroken at this. Of the 12 apostles who followed Jesus, James was the first of the 12 to be martyred. Now we know there had been other martyrs. Stephen was stoned to death, for instance, but this was the first of the 12 apostles to die for Jesus. And, um, you know, when we talked about Stephen being stoned, it was, it was a sad occasion because he was, he was one of the seven deacons. And so he was greatly missed, of course, when he was stoned to death. But James was the first of the 12 that was martyred. And you might think that James should have had some kind of protection over him. You know, James and John, if you remember who they were, they were part of Jesus' yeah. inner circle. James, John, and Peter. It seems like they were the three that were always there with Jesus. And if you remember James and John, they were the sons of Zebedee. And their mother was thought to be Salome. Which one was Jesus' brother? Well, that was another James. Yeah, right. That was another James. But there was, a, but there's two different Jameses. Okay. Okay. So the James in our story today was son, the son of Zebedee and the mother Salome, who was thought to be the sister of Jesus' mother Mary. So it's commonly believed that James and John were cousins of Jesus, not his brother, mm -hmm. which is another James. Um, and so they were Jesus' cousins, and you know James and John were were well loved apostles. They were known as the sons of thunder. Yeah. <laughs> I can't imagine how devastated John was to lose his brother. But really, all these twelve, they were like brothers, right? And so to lose James would have been a horrible, devastating thing. And so now James has been killed, and he's died a martyr's death. Um, and you know, like I said, you would think that because he was so close to Jesus, that he would have had some kind of special protection on his life, but Jesus promised no special protection for even his closest followers. In fact, in Matthew 10, he even warned them to be ready for persecution. He said, starting in verse 16, I am sending you out like sheep among the wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will, be, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. And so Jesus warned them that they were going to see persecution. And if you remember in the book of Mark chapter 10, John and James, James and John, they were the ones who came to Jesus and asked him. In fact, this is exactly what they asked him. Let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in glory. Yeah. They they were vying for position next to Jesus in his kingdom, right? They were still, of course, they were still expecting an earthly kingdom. And Jesus replied to them, you do not know what you ask. Can you drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? And so that was a reference to the fact that just as Jesus was going to be persecuted and he was going to suffer and die that that could happen to them as well. Um, and so James and John, they didn't really know what they were getting into. And the martyrdom of James was really a fulfillment of what Jesus spoke about to them that day. Uh, so King Agrippa, King Herod Agrippa had James beheaded. And James is no longer with them. He has gone on to be with Jesus in glory. And so King Agrippa was already popular among the Jews. He allowed them to celebrate their festivals. Um, their Jewish festivals. Um, and he saw that the killing of James more or less improved his numbers in the polls. The people liked that he did that. Can you believe that? The people liked it. And so he says, hey, these people really like that I killed James, so I think I'll just go and arrest Peter too now. So he got the big idea that he was going to do the same thing to Peter. So he had Peter arrested. It said in verse 3, because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. 
After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. That's a lot of guards for one person. It really is, isn't it? <laughs> that just shows you how they, they had heard about all the miracles and stuff. And you know, Peter had escaped prison once before. Peter and the apostles had been freed by an angel of the Lord before. Remember, somehow they were miraculous freed from a, a local jail before and they appeared back in the temple courts preaching. So King Agrippa had probably heard about this. And so he wasn't gonna take any chances. He had 16 Roman soldiers guarding Peter on rotation like he was some kind of a dangerous criminal. <laughs> he's a slick one. He could get out. He could, he could escape. Um, he's a slippery one, right. He somehow made an escape before with his brothers, and so King Agrippa was going to make sure his soldiers did not let that happen again. Um, so this time, Peter, like I said, they guarded him with more, what I would call a high security detail of Roman soldiers. Um, and, you know, King Agrippa intended to bring him before the people after the Passover, um, Harold Agrippa decided to deal with Peter in what he thought was a politically opportune time. One commentator suggests he had three reasons for delaying the ex execution of Peter after he arrested him. One, he wanted to show how he scrupulously observed the Passover himself. <laughs> and he wanted to wait until the Passover crowds had dissipated and gone home for fear that there could be a riot. And then lastly, he also wanted to wait until he had the full attention of the Jewish population. He didn't want to um, have the distraction of the Passover celebration when he killed Peter. Uh, verse 5 goes on to say, So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. So Herod had his well-trained Roman soldiers and his fortified prisons, but the church had the power of prayer. Um, and that's the title of our lesson, lesson today, praying. Praying is the title of our lesson. The idea here in this verse that the church was pray, earnestly praying for him, this idea of constant or earnest prayer, it has the idea of someone literally stretching out all they can for something. The verb ectinos is related to ectines, ectines, a medical term describing the stretching of a muscle to its limits. Luke uses the same word, ectinos, to describe the agonizing prayer of Jesus back in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's from Luke 22, 44. So it appears that these, these other disciples were gathered and they were praying for Peter all through the night, right up until the time Peter showed up. Um, you know, and you get the impression that they didn't fall asleep. They were up praying until Peter showed up. But, you know, when they were in the Garden with Jesus, they kept falling asleep. You know, Peter, uh, Jesus was praying earnestly, he was sweating wow. blood in the garden, and his, his beloved disciples were too sleepy to pray. But this night, it appears that all those early church disciples, they're gathered and they are praying earnestly. And if you think about this, think about what has just happened to them. They just lost James, and they were afraid that they were about to lose Peter. And so they were not falling asleep. They were earnestly, earnestly praying for Peter's safety and for his release. Um, and so that gets us kind of to where we start in our focal verses today. Acts 12, verses 6 through 18, if you'll read that for us, starting at 6. On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. Or, yeah, the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter's side and woke him up, saying, Get up quickly. And his chains fell, fell from his hands. And the angel said to him, Gird yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow. And he did not know what, know what was being done by the angel, but did not, did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but he thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. 
When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for sure that the Lord has set forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that, and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where, where many were gathered together and were praying. When he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in <laughs> and announced that Peter was standing at the front of the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and they saw him, they were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them that how the Lord had led him out of the prison, and he said, Report these things to James and the brethren. Then he left and went to another place. Now when the day came, there was no small disturbance among the soldiers as to what, what could have become of Peter. So There's there's a little bit of humor that in this funny. story. Yeah, the way funny. You, you know, going, hey dudes. You know, there's there's there, a little bit of humor in there. Up, you know, um, so. so this time when they arrested <laughs> Peter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this time when Peter is in jail, he's in prison, he's got this 16-man rotating high security yeah. detail looking out for him. And... They didn't have him handcuffed to one soldier. They had him handcuffed to two soldiers, one on each side. And so there were always four soldiers guarding Peter. Um, and so there were two right there literally handcuffed to him and two that kept watch outside of the cell. And then, you know, and this is then during the night in verse 7, it says, Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. Now, somehow, this bright light of this angel from the Lord shines in the cell, but it doesn't wake anyone up. It doesn't. Either, either the prison guards don't see it, or they're asleep, or something, because they are clueless about what is happening. Or the Lord keeps them asleep. Yeah, the Lord maybe keeps them asleep supernaturally, uh, but they. Didn't, and, but what's interesting to me here is that Peter was also asleep. Peter didn't wake up. Peter was sleeping so soundly that this bright light did not wake him up. The angel had to poke Peter in the side it, it, to wake it, him up. The word that she used, he did not tap him or anything. It he was a it, it was a strike. <laughs> it was a um, <laughs> exactly. It, it, it wasn't a gentle it's, it's nudge. Peter. Wake up, Peter. Peter's got problems anyway. <laughs> this angel was like, get up, get up. So yeah, the the angel had to strike him. To get him up. And, and so the fact that he was able to sleep so soundly and so deeply tells me that he really didn't have any signs of anxiety. But yet he knew. He knew what they had just done to James. He had to know that was about to happen to him too. That he was probably about to be beheaded probably the next day. Um, but yet remember what Psalm 127.2 says. He gives his beloved sheep. That verse says, in vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. I need to remember this verse when I wake up in the middle of the night and I have trouble falling back asleep. I, I Instead of lying in bed thinking about all the things I need to do the next day, I'm going to close my eyes and claim this promise. <laughs> he grants sleep to those he loves. I love that verse. And so that's Peter appeared to be sleeping peacefully even though he was in jail and his death could have been imminent um and so verse 7 says the angel struck peter on the side and woke him up and said quick get up and the chains <clears throat> fell off peter's wrist then the angel said to him put on your clothes and sandals and peter did so wrap your cloak around you and follow me the angel told him so the angel woke peter and instantly his chains fell off so it seems like when Peter awoke, he was still kind of groggy. He was maybe half asleep. And so the angel was kind of having to tell him what to do. He was not awake and thinking clearly. You know, sometimes when you, you're awakened at night, you bolt wide awake and your senses are like on heightened alert. But it seems like Peter was still kind of like, what is going on? 
Like he, it's almost like he didn't have a care in the world. You know, he, he's kind of like, okay, I'm half asleep. What's going on? And the angel was having to direct him very specifically, put your shoes on, put your clothes on. We're getting out of here. And so Peter does do what the angel tells him to do. It says in verse nine, Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. And I can see why Peter might think that in his drowsy stupor. Um, it hadn't been that long since Peter had been in that trance and saw that vision about the white sheet. So this felt to him almost like this isn't real. This is another vision. I mean, let's face it. If we saw an angel, we might think we're dreaming too. Like it just doesn't feel real, right? And so he's still not sure what's really happening. It says in verse 10, they passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. So this is such a miracle. The chains, the guards, the prison doors, nothing was too big for God to get them past. God manages to miraculously get Peter past all these obstacles and get him out of prison. And this, you know, so Peter and his appointed angel, they they just walk out, basically. Walk out. It's very clear that God was with Peter. And we also know, of course, he sent the angel. But so God sent the angel. But then while this was going on, his brothers and sisters in Christ were back at a house covering him in prayer. Um, I was thinking about that locked iron gate that Peter and the angel came to. You know, that iron gate could be a metaphor for so many different things in our lives that we might worry about. Um, many of us worry about how we're going to get through that iron gate long before we ever get to it. Um, you know, a month beforehand, weeks, days, hours before, we're anxious about some iron gate in our lives. But God takes care of those iron gates when we come to it. Um, he takes care of the iron gates. For Peter, it says it opened, quote, of its own accord. That phrase uses the Greek word automate. One could say that the gates opened automatically yeah. for, for Peter and the angel, which I think is weird. It's almost like the angel had a clicker in his hand. Gate <laughs> okay, just opened up. And then once Peter was safely away inside the city, the angel left him. And what a miracle this is. All the things that happened, that none of the guards saw the angel. Nobody was awakened. They appeared to be all supernaturally asleep or oblivious. They didn't see Peter and the angel coming out right before their eyes. Um, so this is really a huge miracle. And then it says in verse 11 that Peter... Peter finally comes to himself. It's like he's finally waking up. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. So that verse indicates they are still awake praying for Peter. So after, after this angel left him, Peter, he woke up. He realized that, yes, this is God rescuing him. And that's a big rescue because I'm sure that Peter, he knew what had just happened to James. He was fully expecting the same thing to happen to him. And so he might have even been wondering. I mean, I would have been. God, you... Peter, I mean, James was just killed. How is it that you're rescuing me? So, you know, all these thoughts were probably going through Peter's head. But Peter... Isn't Peter perceived to be the first pope? I mean, isn't he... He is. Yeah, so he is considered he is. to be. Yeah, so probably perceived to be. Yeah. He is. He is technically, yeah, the first, uh -huh. the first pope, mm -hmm. so to speak, in, so in that, early church why, history. Maybe that's why he gave him pass. Maybe so. Yeah. Um, you know, one man, James, was martyred. Mm -hmm. Yet Peter was rescued from death. It doesn't mean that God loved Peter more or less than James. Nobody could say that Peter was more righteous or more deserving or less mistake prone than James. Um, maybe, you know, you can't say that maybe the church didn't pray enough for James. No, no. 
God alone knows and decides. God alone determines the number of our days. Um, Exodus 23, 26 says, the number of your days God will fulfill. So for whatever reason, God had decided that James had already fulfilled his mission. But Peter's mission was not yet complete. And so it was, it was really, it was God's sovereign decision to um, save Peter this night. Um, there's a story recorded in church history by Eusebius who relates a story from Clement of Alexandria who said the soldier who was guarding James before the judge was so affected by James' witness that he declared himself a Christian also and was also willingly executed for Jesus alongside of James. So that is, though it's not in the Bible, that's a story from our early church history and that tells us that God did use James right up until the very end. To the very end, James was telling the good news of Jesus and he saved a man who was there to guard him. Um, so I love that little, little piece of, of church history. So um, James was martyred, Peter was rescued. That's the glorious work of God in a man named James and the glorious work of God in a man named Peter. God chose to rescue Peter. It just wasn't his time yet. Listen to what this one commentator says. The reason God does such things or does not do them are often known only to him. We do know that James, having graduated to glory, did not consider himself a loser in any way. Simply, it wasn't time for Peter to go to his heavenly home yet. Until it was time, he was invulnerable. He couldn't be harmed. It was time for James. It was not time for Peter. So both of these men were happy to serve the Lord in whatever way God chose and for however long God chose to allow them to be here to serve. So getting back to our story, this angel left Peter once he was safely inside the city and Peter knew right where to go. He was going to go to his family, his brothers and sisters in Christ. He knew where Christians would be gathered and praying for him. I'm sure he went to the house of Mary um, he probably thought, they're praying for me, and I'm, I'm going to show up as an answer to their prayers. That was probably going through his head. And by the way, this house of Mary, this is Mary, the mother of John Mark, the same Mark who wrote the book of Mark. Um, so they were gathered there. It says in verse 13, Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. <laughs> and they said, you're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said, and then he left for another place. Isn't this, a, this is just a great story. Cool story. That is James, the brother of Jesus. That is, that's exactly right. Because obviously the other he's, James is dead. Yeah, he's the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He is, it's exactly right. He's, he's referring to James, the brother of Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, I love this story. So Peter wanted immediately to go to where his brothers and sisters in Christ would be gathered and praying for him. But then this adorable Rhoda answers the door. <laughs> and even open it, yeah. <laughs> she was so overjoyed. You get the impression, I'm picturing her as this young woman yeah. who's maybe a little... Hyper. Uh, something. I know. She's so overjoyed, she forgets to open the door for Peter, and she runs back in to tell everybody Peter's at the door, and then, then I kind of feel bad for her because nobody believes her, you know? Um, and so they, they said she was out of her mind. Mm -hmm. And poor Rhoda. <laughs> but that's what they were praying for, and then they didn't believe. It, that is so true. So here we are. They are earnestly praying for Peter, but yet they're in disbelief that Peter is there and God has answered their prayers. They cannot believe it. I love that. Yeah, so yeah, you would think. Bit of a disconnect. Yeah. There, there is. You know what? Again, when I see God's people, <laughs> it, you know, it gives me hope for us, right? There's hope for us, too, because. We're, we're all flawed, right? So they, they, they didn't get it right away either. No one believed her. Poor Rhoda. These amazing faith-filled Christians, they didn't believe that the man that they had been praying for was at the door. 
Um, they thought Rhoda was crazy. They probably were like, Rhoda, you're interrupting our prayers. <laughs> they're like, get back in here so we can continue praying for Peter. You know, and they're just not acknowledging that Peter's there already. Um, so maybe they didn't have as much faith as we think that they had. I mean, we know that they were earnestly praying, but let's say they weren't perfect yet. How many times are we shocked and surprised when God answers our prayers? I mean, let's, we're the same way. Well, it's like you said, the Iron Gate, I mean, whatever that is, an exam or, or, or a class or anything that you, you perceive as difficult or insurmountable, and then and then somehow you get through, you know, and, and so that happens quite a bit, mm -hmm. you know, quite a bit, if, yeah. if you try. You know? and, and, you know, thankfully, Peter kept knocking. Yeah. <laughs> Peter kept knocking at the door, <laughs> and finally, they opened the door and saw him, and they were astonished. Even though they had been praying for him earnestly, for just this to happen, for him to be safe and released, when... When God showed them that he was there with them and that he had clearly answered their prayers, they are astonished. They're surprised. <laughs> They're surprised by it. In fact, it appears that they were all in such an uproar that Peter had to motion with his hands for them to quiet down so he could tell her story, to tell his story. Well, plus he was like, hey, I'm running from a wall, you guys. <laughs> Uh, so, so it's funny. I mean, there, there is kind of a little bit of humor in this story. You know, I think about Rhoda and Mary and all these people who were gathered there and how they couldn't believe what was going on. And, and I was thinking, yes, Lord, the, these are my people. I can relate to these people. I can't wait to meet these, these people someday. They're earnestly praying for Peter, who they love, but yet they, they're still like, don't, can't believe that God has just answered their prayer in such a miraculous way. Of course, Peter knows now at this point that he needs to lay low, and um, he knows that people are going to be looking for him. <laughs> and so he tells them to tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, and then he left for another place. And of course, like you said, he was referring to the other James, James, the brother of Jesus. It says then in verse 18, I love this, in the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. You can imagine. Yeah, I think that's an understatement. <laughs> yeah. You know, there was a huge commotion. Huge commotion. Literally, heads were rolling. You're exactly right. Because they had lost their prisoner. And this is not a happy ending for those 16 Roman soldiers who were supposed to be guarding Peter. The ones that were attached to him. Yeah. The, 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 Can you? Bible, yeah. How did they explain that? The yeah. Bible doesn't tell us, but there was severe punishment. I assure you. Yeah. Well, it does say in verse nineteen. It says after yeah, Herod so yeah. had a thorough search made for uh, Peter and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and yeah. ordered that they be executed. Okay. Yeah. So the, you were right. Heads were, were rolling. They were. Yeah. They were rolling. Yeah. They were not squeamish about such things like no, that. No. No. Off with their heads. Um, and then. Of course, this isn't part of our story today, but I, I like to read a little ahead and see what happens next because yeah. the next few verses talk about how King Herod Agrippa comes to his end. Um, it says that Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre, starting in verse 20, by the way. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They now joined together and sought an audience with him. After securing the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country to their food, uh, for their food supply. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of a god, not of a man. <laughs> And immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. He was eaten by worms before he died. Yes. He was eaten by worms and died. Uh, the church history story uh, explains that he was painfully sick for five days before he died. This makes it sound like he died instantly. Oh, no. He suffered for days as the worms were eating him from the inside out. <laughs> if you read the, the church history part that's not in the Bible. His, so, family, his family had to court the popular opinion of Jews because yes, the, 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 Herod, the Herod family was yeah. put in that place by the Romans. Mm -hmm. And so yep. we're not talking about 
kings of the Jews who are descended from David or anything right, like that. Right, right. No, exactly. So here's this King Agrippa, Herod Agrippa. He's He's got all these people who are trying to win his favor so they can get food. Uh, and they're going to do or say anything to flatter him, right? Um, and King Herod Agrippa, he is just drinking it all in, right? Um, he did not give glory to God, and God struck him down, and he was eaten, eaten by worms and died. And, you know, some of you may be itching for me to make a modern political application here, but I am not going to go there, not going to go there. But I will, I do read this story and want to make a personal application and that personal application, it's a warning to us to be aware of pride. Um, we need to be searching our hearts for things we do for our own glory instead of things we do for the glory of God. Are we so self-righteous that we don't need God? Um, one, I found one little short article about pride. This is a good one. Pride is our greatest enemy because it makes God our enemy. God opposes the proud. That's from James 4, 6 and 1 Peter 5, 5. Why? What makes pride so repulsive to God is the way that pride contends for supremacy with God himself. Pride is not one sin among many, but a sin in a class by itself. Other sins lead the sinner further from God, but pride is particularly heinous in that it attempts to elevate the sinner above God. Pride also gives birth to more sins. For example, pride can lead to lying. You tell a lie because you are too proud to admit you are wrong or that you did something wrong. But the problem is so much bigger. Pride doesn't just tell lies, it is a lie. Pride is self-obsession, a preoccupation with ourselves. It is a lie about reality. It says, I am worth thinking about all the time. It's an orientation that wrongly assumes that everything revolves around us. Think of yourself less. Maybe this will make more sense if we talk about what humility is. As C.S. Lewis said, true humility is not thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less. We can spend a lot of time thinking less of ourselves, but we only end up thinking a lot about ourselves. The problem of pride does not boil down to whether we think high thoughts or low thoughts about ourselves, but that we think lots of thoughts about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Humility is just a form of self-forgetfulness as opposed to pride's self-fixation. Humility can set you free because when you think about yourself less, you are free to think about Christ more. Humility puts us on the path of grace. Pride puts us on the path of opposition. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So as we wrap this story up today, this is, this is such a good reminder. <laughs> Poor King Herod Agrippa. It's a, he is, he's a reminder to us to do, like Josh says, do everything for the good of others and the glory of God. Give all the glory to God. Don't get, don't get eaten by worms. Um, so King Herod Agrippa is dead. His Roman soldiers are dead. But look how our story ends in verse 24. But the word of God continued to spread and flourish. So God was showing us who was really in charge. Yes, we lost Peter. But God had allowed, I said Peter, James. Yes, we lost James. Sorry. We lost James, but God allowed James to fulfill the number of his days and to fulfill his mission while he was here on earth. And he did. He, he did it right until the very end. Um, God is really in charge. He rescued Peter because Peter wasn't done yet. Peter wasn't finished yet. Herod was judged and the church was blessed. You can't fight against God and win. Herod learned that the hard way. You can't fight against God's people and win. The word of God and the work of God goes on. Any other comments about, about our story today? I love this story. I really, I, I love that we have a lot of songs about it too. Uh, will y'all bow your heads with me and we'll close in prayer.